first, first I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak. So, uh, talk about some results on premium digital serums and um, lots of data today, especially in chromatic SPD phases with infractions. Okay, so digital chromatic serum is a classic result in quantum magnetism. magnetism. Um, the statement is that you have a C1 half chain. <coughs> And Antonia is both translation parent and preserved the SO3 spin rotation symmetry. Then the ground state must be degenerate. It's either degenerate, spontaneous symmetry breaking, or the gap just vanishes. And here, of course, the assumption that Antonia shall range and preserves both symmetries. And in 1D, the implications are very clear. So either you have gapless spin arms, or you get spontaneous hybridization because you cannot spontaneously break the uh, spin rotation symmetry. So the theorems, the theorem was generalized to higher dimensions by um, Oshikawa and Hastings, and the statement is very similar. Now, the uh, condition that you have all number of sigma half per unit cell, and again, Antonio should preserve transformation and spin rotation symmetry. But then in this case, there's one more option, namely you have to go to order. Um, which is going to realize a symmetric spin liquid. Right? So you have three options, either a gap list, and gap list could also be a gap list, exotic gap list spin liquid, or symmetry breaking, or a uh, spin liquid. So these are the three options that are given by digital semantic theorem, digital semantic Oshikawa Hasten theorems in higher dimensions, and more recently there has been many generalizations replacing, for example, the spin rotation symmetry with a smaller symmetry group, like time reversal symmetry, and can also uh, extend uh, spatial symmetry from translations to other you know, space group or point. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the generalization of these theorems to the fermionic system. So before that, let me give a slightly different perspective on the Lipschitz magic theorem um, through the bulk boundary correspondence. So basically, I want to interpret the Lipschitz magic theorem as a consequence on of a surface anomaly on the boundary of three dimensional SPT, symmetry protective phase. But the symmetry protective phase, of course, is a weak one because it requires translation symmetry, which plays an important role in the theorem itself. So the kind of bulk state in three dimension um, that I have in mind is this one. So you basically have a step of <laughs> an array of ordained chains. Um, Know, going along the third direction. And as we all know, holy chains have boundary modes which are exactly the same one half. So if you just look at the surface of this three dimensional state, you'll see exactly um, the, the lattice of spin one half. And although the bulk looks very simple, it's just a stack of uh, holy chains, it is indeed a three dimensional symmetry protected phase, phase if you consider both translation in the plane and spin rotation symmetry. <coughs> Therefore, um, we can easily interpret, I mean, it's not really a proof, it's an interpretation of Lipschitz's matters, much power Heisen theorems, as a consequence of bulk boundary correspondence, because we know that the boundary of a three-dimensional SVD phase has to be anomalous. Um, it, it simply cannot have a unique gap to ground state preserving all symmetries. And therefore, the three options follow that you may have a gapless state or symmetry breaking, or you can have symmetric surface topological order. But in this context, it's just a spin liquid on the 2D surface. So three-dimensional uh, three bulk state serves as kind of a theoretical tool to understand Lipschitz's magic theorem um, in this context. So it immediately suggests generalization of theorems um, to other systems. You can basically replace this three-dimensional ball, the three-dimensional ball with other kind of weak SPD phase. For example, we can replace this holding chain with some other 1D SPT. For example, you can consider a weak fermionic SPT in three dimensions. Um, of course, the one that, that's relevant is, again, this array of 1D chains, but now each 1D chain is fermion SPT in one dimension. So what is a fermion SPT in one dimension? Well, it comes in two varieties. So either it's, it has unpaired Majorana zero mode on the boundary, that's known as P5 chain or Majorana chain, or if you look at how symmetry acts on the boundary, 
has even number of wire modes, but the symmetry action actually changes from parity. So it comes in two types. So again, um, easily write down solvable models. For example, this is probably known to everybody. Um, realization of the type chain in one dimension. Just easily realize it using a pivot superconductor and it has a dangling wire modes on two ends. And you can take two of these chains and no longer have equal number of minor modes on the boundary, but if you consider a non-trivial symmetry, for example, in this case, you can consider symmetry, which is from parity of one of the chains, and many of these chains are decoupled. Then, although you have two minor modes on the boundary, you cannot couple them because the coupling term, which is basically I times um, two minor modes, is odd under the symmetry transformation. One of them gets minus time the other remains invariant, so this term is off. So this is a very simple model of uh, a one-dimensional formula SVT protected by this unitary internal z Okay, so within, with this in mind, you can easily construct three-dimensional version of this state by just packing them in an array. And then, again, we can just single out a surface and make a statement about what happens in this surface. Which, is, which, can, which can be alternatively viewed as a 2D system. So I'll first talk about this um, second case where you actually have two more modes on the boundary of this 1D chain, which you can combine into a complex fermion mode. And if you do that, you'll see that the symmetry <coughs> transformation actually acts as a polypole transformation on this complex fermion mode. So it's a stingless fermion mode, a single complex fermion, and this C2 symmetry acts as polypole. So it's a unitary particle, not the anti-unitary one that we usually talk about in the context of, for example, um, no levels. This is the unitary particle symmetry. And the kind of lattice model I have in mind is very simple. You just consider, for example, square or triangle lattice. Um, you have single fermion, complex fermion mode per side, spinless fermions. And you can write down, for example, you know, hopping and um, nearest neighbor interactions or more, more complicated interactions. And we impose a particle symmetry on the model, which takes C to C back, that's all it does. And that symmetry will restrict, for example, the hopping amplitudes to imaginary values. Um, we just take it strictly. And the one that I wrote down has charge conservation, but it's not required. Although in that case, the particle symmetry will imply hot fitting, and then, of course, we will have a more familiar Lipschitz matrix here, but it's not necessary. We can write on term that break the charge, well, break the charge innovation, but still preserve the particle symmetry. So this is very, very simple kind of uh, class of models where you can also have uh, a trivial <coughs> Lipschitz matrix Hastings from um, Charles Hastings theorem, and again, find the symmetry that are very translation and this particular particle transformation. So the proof of the theorem um, is actually not long, unlike the spin version. Um, so, basically, what you can do is you can write down the symmetry generator of this particle symmetry, which takes this form, as you expect, that, um, this particular operator does the job. And you consider a system on torus with uh, even number of sites. I mean, you can also do the autonomous site, but then in that case, it's a bit trivial. Then you can look at how the symmetry generator commutes with the translation. Okay, so couple lines of algebra, you can convince yourself that depending on um, the size of torus, the translation stay along x and the symmetry generator may not commute. So for example, if it's both even, then they commute and there's nothing you can say. This is the same as the spin of uh, Lipschitz magic theorem. For even by even torus, you cannot make uh, any statement. So then for even by all torus, well, you'll find that the uh, two symmetries, translation and um, this particle symmetry, anti-commute, so it implies that you at least have to have two folded pairs. And then you can interpret it in different ways. Either comes from a gap based spectrum or symmetry breaking of what other states. So that is proof of the Lipschitz methods, is this uh, of Hissing theorem in this context. All right, but uh, we're also interested in to know more what you know, the consequence of these theorems. Of course, we know that there are three options that you can have a get this <laughs> spectrum. And in this case, it's very simple. Just, just write down a free fermion hopping model, and you will have a fermion surface. That's it. 
Um, or you can have a spontaneous simple breaking. So you know, if you turn on near neighbor interruptions, you will most likely, most likely will get some charge density wave or superconductivity depending on the sign. So they will, that will break either translation or hypothesis. So <coughs> and of course, we are more interested in the third option, which is a state that preserves all the symmetry, but necessarily will have uh, an end of the gap, but necessarily will to have a topological order. So you have anions, anionic body particles um, in this state and transforming non trivial under symmetry. So the claim is that for, for this to happen in this topological order state, uh, anions have to be permuted by the translation. Basically, if you have an anion sitting there and you translate, you act translation um, on this anion, you'll find that anion changes its personality, becomes a different character, different type of anion. And what that implies is that if you put a dislocation into this lattice, this dislocation must be a non-billion object, finds some non-billion zero modes. So um, that might be interesting. OK, so let me uh, quickly explain how to arrive at this conclusion. So you know, in all these it's SPT business, it's always useful to think about symmetry defects of classes. Particularly, if you have unitary symmetry, that's like the first thing you want to do is to think about uh, what kind of things will happen if you insert symmetry fluxes into the system. And in this case, we want to input, insert a Z2 flux. Remember, we have unitary Z2 symmetry, you can just put in a Z2 flux. And there's a generalized Aron bomb effect associated with this Z2 flux is that if you take a particle, whatever excitation around this flux, um, this excitation will be sort of acted upon by the Z2 symmetry. So this is a way to kind of locally implement symmetry on some excitation. It's basically taking it around the flux. Just like what happens if you take an electron around the magnetic flux, you get a phase. Here, you may get some other actions. So maybe this particle will change its type. So why are anions community? Well, to do that, we have to um, think about what happens if you take this notification or the flux that we insert into a system and move it around the unit cell. Okay. And um, so as I just said, moving the flux around the unit cell is equivalent, basically equivalent to uh, locally applying this particle symmetry to the unit cell. And as we know, particle symmetry will take C to C dagger. And if you look at how the particle fermion number um, transforms, it goes from n to 1 minus n. So if you have no fermion, it becomes 1 fermion, vice versa. But the point is that from parity, the number of even all this of fermion number changes in this process. So this is <coughs> something that has to be accomplished by the appropriate low energy theory. The low energy theory has to respond in this way, like if you move a flux around the unit cell, you should get, somehow you should pump out the fermion um, uh, to, to just to uh, compensate this process. So where does this come from in, in for example, to what order state? Well, um, we have to think a little bit further about how symmetries actually act in the topological order phases. And first, there's translation symmetry, obviously playing an important role. So let's first discuss this. And it, in the other phase, there are essentially two ways that translation symmetry can sort of play out. So one, which is uh, probably more familiar, is that if you think about how anions moving move in the lattice, um, although because anions are actually non-local excitations, although the lattice doesn't really in the lattice model there's no magnetic field or anything like that, anions could effectively see a background flux. This is, for example, high flux in the um, slave part of construction of a spin liquid, but you can further generalize to something more general anionic flux sitting in the background, in the ground state. So what I mean is that if you take anion around the unit cell, uh, you effectively pick up some phase that is generated by braiding this anion with a background charge, which I call beta. So this is some quantity that characterizes ground state. The beta, the anion beta, is some quantity that characterizes ground state. And beta has to be a big anion, so they always get a phase. OK, so this is one, um, one kind of manifestation of rationalization of translation symmetry. The translation symmetry becomes a magnetic translation symmetry, essentially. Now, the other one is uh, probably a little less familiar. Uh, so let's just think about 
a Z2 flux, but that's what I will have to use, but you can replace it with any anion. So what happens if you move it on the lattice, you don't have to take it around the unit cell, just move it, say, by one step along some direction. Well, it may change type. Um, so in particular, for the Z2 flux, if you move it, it may become a different kind of Z2 flux. It's still a Z2 flux. It still carries this flux of Z2 symmetry, but um, no, it, it may have different bond charge attached to it. So basically, moving the C2 flux would attach additional bond charge to the flux, and you can also show that you have to attach a beta anion um, to the flux. So these are two things that the translation can do and play with the C2 symmetry. So now you can, we can work out what happens if you move a flux around the unit cell. So as you move, you'll pick up these uh, additional charges, I mean, I didn't justify why I was, why I call this thing not coupling, but um, there's a good reason for that. But anyway, so if you move the flux, you'll pick up this abelian charge along the way, and you can easily figure out what charges you pick up along the path. So that will add up to some abelian anion. And also, because in this process, we apply the symmetry to the background, to this region which contains some background charge, the background charge will also be transformed, possibly, by the symmetry. So you just collect all these things together. These should give you the fermion that I promised, right? That you have to get this fermion out of this process, and these are the only thing you get if you think about the process in the broader order phase. So you collect all these different pieces, you should get fermion. And you can prove that you always have to get fermion. Um, and you may get a, oh, you may get one of fermion, so this will always give you one of a physical fermion, but the requirement that you have to get fermion. And you can easily see that if Tx and Ty, so the notation that if you see the Tx, it means the Tx acts on this particle. And if Tx and Ty don't permute anions, this equation can never satisfy. And as a result, um, in order for this to happen, you have to have anions permuted by symmetry. And as a consequence, you have not been in this location. So that's uh, maybe somewhat interesting implication of the theorem. Um, but really, I think that's maybe one suggestion that this is this kind of model could be interesting to look at if you add other interactions to suppress um, symmetry breaking symmetry breaking states. Okay, so uh, an example. Um, so I will an example of broad order phase that arises in this context is a Z four to broad order that you already saw in Max's talk yesterday by some kind of couple Y construction. I'm not going to go to details, and as we expect, um, the translation will permute anions exactly the same way that Max described to you, uh, that takes a Z4 flux to some other part. And it's the dislocation is the icing dislocation, which carries my R0 more. So consistent, and if you can compute all these quantities, the gammas and this beta, and it agrees with the general condition I said earlier. Okay, so more generally, you can think about what kind of, just no, let's just imagine what kind of weak SPT phase protected by translation symmetries you can have in three dimensions. You can have three kinds of states, so you can just have some charge sitting on the three dimensional values. It has, as trivial as it looks, it's actually a non trivial state if you really want to classify these spaces. And we have these. Um, Step 1D chains, which will give you the Lipschitz Mattis type constraint on the surface. Uh, you can also imagine just stacking these um, 2D states along some direction that is sort of the non interesting limit of the straight line on the hall. And that is that. But still, if you look at the surface, you'll get, you get this surface in simplest case, and you can also describe what kind of anomaly that you get on the surface. So, um, so we can also consider a situation where you have again have a Z two symmetry, but now the plate you have that we use to construct a three dimensional state is a Z two symmetry protected fermion SPT. It's a two well, it's P plus IP and P minus IP are copies of that, and symmetry X in one of the layers. So you can have a stack of these states, and again you can derive condition on the surface. Um, using similar arguments, thinking about how the fluxes move on the surface. And um, so this part, you 
basically have seen in Max's talk. But then here we can use using this kind of argument to derive a constraint that applies to the surface of this particular SPT phase. Okay, so I'm probably gonna skip uh, details here. And there's a even more general condition you can derive while you can use the argument uh, that you know involve a, a series of operations of using the defects and moving them and see what happens to derive this condition. Okay, so uh, so we can put it even in a more general context of what kind of surface states you get on, on for a three-dimensional fermion SPT phase. And this question was recently, a lot of progress was recently made on classification of three-dimensional fermion SPT phases uh, protected by, for example, unitary internal symmetry. So uh, the current understanding that there are three layers of data. Um, so these come in some of the great names for homology data, but they have uh, relatively simple physical interpretations. For example, there's a sigma, which you also saw in Max talk, um, that tells you how Mariana chains are decorated on intersection domain walls. And if you try to construct a wave function of three-dimensional state, and there's this row, which tells you how fermions are decorated on the trijunctions of domain walls. If you have three domain walls, they intersect at one point, you can put fermion there. And there's a, another layer which tells you and bosonic SPT phases. So, um, so the one that the least transmitted type theorems actually fall into this class, the super homology classification. Um, basically, if you treat all the translations as internal symmetry, just formally, you'll find a state that can be described within the uh, typical group super homology classification. And then, um, for the reference, you can basically apply example, the machinery that Max and um, collaborator developed to actually just simply derive this condition that I told you um, from different arguments. Okay, so of course, I um, haven't addressed the question of what kind of surface constraint you'll get if you think about a three-dimensional array of keypad chains where on surface you get a lattice of Majorana modes. Um, again, the question mark, so I don't have an answer, but that will be interesting to look at. So, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly describe some results on interacting fermion that you face in three dimensions. So, as we know, interactions can, um, well, we all know this periodic table of of three fermion that you face, the interactions can change the table in some non trivial ways. For example, know these examples where the integer classification becomes uh, a finite classification by interactions, some states which are non-trivial, um, if you don't allow interactions, become trivialized. You can turn on strong interactions. And of course, interactions can give you more states than the free fermion classification. For example, in the class of Vermilion uh, timers and various logic insulator. So again, there are three things you can do by interactions, generally, to so reduce non correct classification from Z to some subgroup. Uh, it can enable bosonic symmetry protected phases. And the third thing that I am more interested in is so that interaction can allow new fermionic phases which don't exist if you don't have interactions, but neither they are, they are not uh, bosonic states. They are not directly connected to any bosonic phases. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. So when you have interaction, uh, the symmetry can no longer be described by class. Right, right, so right. what symmetry you actually mean when you have this reaction? Oh, yeah, so I guess when I you know, when I write each of these uh, arrows, I always have a particular realization of the single particle symmetry in many body context. This may depend on how you actually realize the symmetry. Uh, because we know that the periodic table, actually, the symmetry you have is the symmetry acting on matrices, Hamiltonian matrices of single particle. Antonian, um, but then we're talking about many one symmetry. So it's a particular realization of many one symmetry uh, that matches the single particle symmetry at that level. The BDI, BD1 would be realized by the time. The problem is that uh, uh, the single particle, there could be different single yeah, particle yeah, symmetry right. which give you the same class. 
Right. But once you include interaction, it's different. The single body symmetry gives you the same class, may give you different many body that's, results. That's true. Yeah. So always have uh, probably like the, some particular particular relation that are very natural. Yeah. But it, it is correct that you have different ways to realize the same single body symmetry at many body level. Um, of course, uh, so speaking about symmetries, crystal symmetries are common in solids, and that's probably. I mean, if you really think about it, a real solid system, you probably just have uh, crystal symmetries, some wallpaper group, uh, the 36 group, and if you consider magnetic symmetry group, so this group you'll have more, and charge conservation cameras on spin rotation. That's pretty much what you get. Um, but recently, well, you can talk about um, classification of these states in the presence of crystal symmetries. So um, recently, there has been uh, also, a lot of uh, progress in that direction, and in particular, there's there's a crystal equivalence principle formulated by Bob Els um, and Brian Sogren that basically say at the level of formal classification, you can play, replace crystal symmetry by a symmetry to preserve the full structure. So that gives a way to say translate results we obtain from internal symmetry classification to crystal symmetries to know what kind of states are there. And you can also use it in the opposite direction. You can use um, crystal symmetry to sort of mimic internal symmetries, and sometimes the actually problems are easier in crystal for crystal symmetries. So I'll discuss rotation symmetry only. And there's a bit of technical detail about how uh, symmetry should be defined in fermionic systems, but I'll just give one example of an interaction enabled fermionic SPT phase. So first, um, we have to think about how to classify rotation symmetry protected phases, and for that, uh, you can apply a dimensional Dutch approach that kind of entangles the states almost completely, but just remains this very simple fixed point state where you have some 1D, this is two dimensions, some 1D state that join at one either at the rotation center, or you can put some one zero point zero dimensional state at the rotation center. So this is fixed point state. So Let's, I'll just give this example and I'll be done. So we can think about this following symmetry. So we have a Z4 symmetry, or C4 symmetry, four four rotation, and time reversal symmetry. And I'll consider the BD1 class, basically T squared equals one, this many body realization of BD1 class, that is a T squared equals one per means. And you can easily convince yourself that there's no nine tracking states here. But applying this dimension reduction picture, there's a very simple way to construct the interacting state. Basically, you can just take this BD1 uh, 1D to right superconductor as this building block and then let them meet at the rotating center. So I choose um, the new equals 2 state, which has two Meyer chains, and you get A Meyer zero modes at the center. So now, for non interacting fermions, there's nothing you can do. They'll just stay there. But now, internal interactions, you get rid of all of them. But there is a little caveat here that you have to make sure the interaction actually preserves the rotation symmetry. And in this case, you can just easily check that this can be done. So you can write down um, actually a CA root invariant interaction, although CA is not better than real solids, but you can still imagine you have a CA symmetry, and interaction can preserve that symmetry. Okay, so you can use that. Um, I'll probably just skip to the last slide where you can, for example, use this. Um, using this approach to construct a table of three-dimensional fermionic symmetry protected phases interacting classification protected by rotation and the internal symmetry that agrees with uh, cohomology classification. Okay, uh, that's a summary and thanks for attention. We have time for one question. Uh, could you comment what's the effect of long-range interactions on this new choice materials? For example, Coulomb interaction, dipole interaction, what would happen in their presence? Um, so, I think the proof will not apply if you have long-range interactions. You cannot either generate the proof, um, because the proof essentially, like the proof by Hastings, essentially uses the Lee Robinson bound. So, uh, that's, that, that becomes questionable if you have long-range interactions, although there are actually recent generalizations of the rocks and found with, uh, with long-range interactions that may be applied to, to see what happens. I don't, I don't have a problem. Okay. So.
let's uh, move on with uh, you know, the next talk.